Hello everyone, my name is Jessica from Germany and I will be the moderator of today's talk in the Youth for Europe series of conferences. I was one of the participants in the Youth Exchange about Environment that took place last year in Romania. Before introducing our topic that will be food and sustainability, I would like to shortly present the Youth for Europe project itself. So Youth for Europe is a project with the aim to gather young people and allow them to participate in the process of policy making, allowing them to tackle just a little bit the topics of environment, media, job and education. This project involved more than 100 youngsters from Italy, Hungary, Germany, UK, Spain and Romania. And it was wonderful to see how much effort these young people have put in the whole process. So I would like to welcome David from Hungary and Alphon from Spain. The participants that are presenting today's proposal our audience that is following live uh, on our Facebook page. And of course, a big uh, welcome to the member of the European Parliament, member of the Committee on Environment, Public Health and Safety, Mr. Andreas Glück. Welcome, Mr. Glück, and thank you so much for participating in our today's conference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. It's really, really nice to be here. Actually, I didn't have to change the spot where I am all day long anyways. So... <laughs> No, it's it's really cool. I think I think it is a very very good thing that we that we um, get in contact. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I still believe that it is really fascinating that we talk to each other like all over Europe um, with uh, such a video conference. Um, probably younger people already did it before, but I actually started like to do in daily video conferences during the Corona crisis now, and. Um, I believe this is what I experienced, that um, I think the crisis is really, really bad. It is very, very challenging for us in a medical field, but as well as in the economic field. Um, but I believe there are some tiny positive aspects. So, for example, the crisis did a lot more for digitalization than the politics of the last year. So, um, so, so I believe um, this is things we will not turn back anymore. Um, I think we all learned... Um, on that maybe it is it makes more sense to go for some video conferences instead of like having 20 people driving for hundreds of kilometers um so i believe this is something which will be good for the future time as well um i believe we have a thank you i believe we have a very um challenging situation um at the moment also for you for this organization i believe that um it's probably not so easy because we actually planned on meeting each other. You planned on meeting each other. And uh, now we have to do it in a different way. Um, but it really, to say it very clear, it really motivates me to see young people taking the challenge, doing stuff, going for their convictions, even though it's like difficult um, circumstances. Um, I believe, uh, or, or let me put it that way. I mean, when I see you young people um, want to change the world and also taking challenges, it kind of reminds me um, of my of myself. Um, I could I could never accept people telling me, yes, there's a problem, you know, but we can't change it. Um, growing up with a liberal mindset means um, that I want to take responsibility for myself, for my environment, for the consequences of my decisions. And I want to motivate them. I, I believe this is also a job, my job as a politician. I want to, make, to, to, to motivate people, especially as a liberal. I want to motivate people to take their own decisions and also to take their own responsibility. Um, so this is actually what I'm doing um, all day long. And I just don't do it as a medical doctor, which I am. Um, I don't only do it as a politician, but this is also the way how I treat my, my children. They have to go for decisions and they have to take the responsibility. Of course, their children, they can't, you know, just like take the whole responsibility. This is what parents are there for as well. But, but anyways, um, so I believe that it's, it's a motto between freedom and decision, the possibility for free decisions on one hand, and there is the responsibility on the other hand, but this is just, you know, it just like fits together. There's no freedom without responsibility. And um, so this is also how I face my patients. I'm, I'm a trained surgeon, um, a general surgeon, and I still practice at the hospital like once 
once a week. So every week on Monday, I work in a hospital in southern Germany. And I think, I believe the combination out of those two jobs, like being a politician, but being a medical doctor as well, um, it really helps me a lot because um, in medicine, I was taught some skills. So for example, the skill of close listening. Um, this is something sometimes I miss in politics, you know, like politicians just being able to speak, but not being able to listen. And another very interesting thing is that I really have to do with a lot of different people when I work at the, at the, at the hospital, like in politics, it's kind of different, you know, you're just like talking in this politician bubble or whatever. And so, so not for me, I, I really believe that I still have a very, very good contact to normal people, which usually maybe don't really have to do a lot of with politics. Um, in 2011, I was, I was uh, elected as a member of state parliament of Baden-Württemberg. And this is a very, very strong, innovative region um, located in southern Germany. We have a lot of small and medium-sized um, enterprises, companies. We have a lot of, uh, of hidden champions. And I believe that we as politics should not interfere too much with innovation processes, especially when it comes to the field of climate change. Um, I think politics is really important to set the right incentives um, to be technology neutral. So it means we want, for example, a CO2 emission reduction, but we don't want to tell the companies of how to do that because they have to find out and the universities what is, what is the best possibility to do it? And then I believe that we have, I just have to turn off my phone real quick. Just in, sorry. And then I believe that we have several um, technologies which we can, which go into competition with each other. And some, some new technologies will survive, others will not survive. And we need plenty of technologies anyways. I don't believe that if it comes to questions of, of um, of energy supply for the future, for example, that there is only one technology uh, which we can rely on. I believe that it's a whole stack of technologies. And so I believe politics shouldn't say which technology is the right one, but I believe that we should go um, and set, uh, and set um, uh, incentives, incentives was the word. Um, Already as a member of the state parliament of Baden-Württemberg, I was working in the environmental committee, and this is what I'm doing here in the European Parliament as well. As you can imagine, we have um, like the environmental part in our ENVI committee, we have uh, food safety in our committee, and we have um, public health in our committee. So in the beginning, there was a lot of um, environmental politics, energy politics, and it was like only a tiny little rest of like um, public health. Now you can imagine <laughs> that everything kind of turned around. Um, we are really working a lot on, on COVID, COVID related um, issues. And as you can imagine um, right now, medical expertise is very highly demanded in, in politics. Um, I could not talk a lot more. Um, yeah, maybe one point. Um, very often they say European politics is so slow and it's so much bureaucracy. What I experienced for the last three quarters of a year um, was that we have a very young parliament here, a lot of motivated people, um, also in the other groups. It's not only a Renew Europe and German FTP thing, it's really, we have, I have a good relationship to a lot of, a lot of colleagues. And when it is necessary, we can go for fast decisions. So for example, the medical device regulation, I believe, I was, I was a shadow rapporteur on this. I believe it was so important that producers of medical devices are not, um, are not filled up with more bureaucracy at the moment. So what we did is we, um, um, just hang on, what's for Sheben in English? Postpone. We, we postponed the medical devices we did one year. Um, so just to make clear that producers of medical devices, for example, can do their job at the moment because their work is so important because without medical devices, it's not possible, for example, to ventilate patients. One last thought for the end. Um, I had some weeks of home office, did a lot of video conferences from home, 
Um, and last week was the week when I came to Brussels for the first time. Um, and I experienced something I want to share with you. It was the German-Belgian border. I was stopped and I had to show my passport. I mean, this is nothing really new for me because um, when I was young, it was normal that we would show our passports when we crossed you know, inner European borders. But I, but I hadn't to do this for a very, very long time and really felt strange. And it kind of reminded me that very often we just take things for granted, you know, they're just there. They're good, they're just there, but we kind of ignore them because they're already normal to us. Um, but those values, like for example, being able to, to travel in the European Union or also um, to, to run businesses over, over borders in Europe without any problem or the decision you wanna, the decision you wanna go to university, you want to work in Europe. Very often we take it for granted, but it's not. All those issues we have to fight for every, every single day. And as German FTP and Renew Europe, we really want to go for that. We do this work with, um, with a lot of power. We really, all my colleagues, including myself, really, really work a lot, a lot. And I just want to remind that the good things Europe brings to all of us, um, they're, they're not you know, coming by itself. They are things um, we all have to work for. And so I'm really happy to be here because I know I have friends of the European Union sitting right in front of me. Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing yourself, uh, Mr. Glück, and for your thoughts that you shared with us. Um, before we start with the proposals and the presentation, I would like to ask you one more question regarding introduction, um, introduction question to our topic environment today. Um, I've seen that you took part in the UN Climate Change Conference in 2019 um, about the climate and envi environmental urgency, uh, emergency. And there you said, if I'm not wrong, that you prefer the, the term urgency instead of emergency when it comes to climate change. Mm -hmm. Could you just uh, uh, explain shortly what are you thinking, what are you meaning uh, by saying mm -hmm. that? Yeah, I'd love to. Actually, um, you know, I think there are different styles of, of, of going into politics. Um, the one style is, and a lot of people do it, and if you go to the right, far right or to the far left, they use this mechanism. For example, the far right, they say, all the refugees coming, you know, all the money we spent for the European Union, you know, we're gonna be broke and everything is going to be bad, except maybe you vote for us, maybe we can fix it, you know. They work like that they wanna make people afraid of some things. And then they say, okay, but if you vote for me, maybe I, maybe I can stop it. Um, I wanna work with encouragement. I see it the other way around. I see that we have a lot of challenges we have to face, but I don't believe that people go in for smart decisions if they are afraid of something. I want to encourage for powerful decisions. And because of that, I kind of don't like the word emergency. Um, and by the way, for me as a medical doctor, an emergency is like really like having a motorcycle driver on the, uh, laying on the ground, you know, bleeding and all this. But, but um, because the proposal came from the French. In French, there's only one word for it. C'est ur urgence. Urgence means emergency, but it means urgency as well. And in my belief, I think that this was, this was a translation failure in the from the beginning on. Because I believe when it comes to, um, to the climate crisis, I believe that if we say urgency, it's, it really says it is urgent. We have to do something but we don't want to make people afraid, you know, just, this is really bad, we're all going to die. Besides, you vote for us, maybe we can stop it. I don't like this mechanism, so I don't like the word climate emergency. I prefer um, the term of climate urgency, which I, I believe is a lot stronger and a lot better placed here. Thank you very much for your explanation on that. Uh, I believe it's time to pass now to the event we all gathered for today, and that will be our proposals. Please remember to comment and ask questions on our Facebook page and in the chat, and later we will try to answer them if we have time. Now I will pass the floor to David, who will tell us something more about his group's proposal, Permaculture for Permanent Change, please. Hello, everyone. First of all, can you hear me right? Yeah? Okay, cool. 
So I would like to welcome everyone. I'm David from Hungary and I would like to thank uh, Mr. Gluck for joining us today. It's uh, really a great pleasure. Now I'm just quickly sharing my screen so that you can see the um, proposal our uh, group made. And yeah, let me just put it into, yeah, so. <clears throat> so if everyone can see it all right, uh, I would like to start. The title of our group, the title of our project was Permaculture for a Permanent Change. It's basically, we had this very nice catchphrase that you should, when talking about permaculture, you should imagine a society where people support each other, live harmoniously with nature and have a sustainable lifestyle. Then we came up with some key words regarding permaculture. Permaculture is basically a care for the earth and the people at the same time while um, ensuring that both, both the earth and the people get their fair shares. Now, practically, this method is uh, revolutionary because it avoids monocropping by cultivating biodiversity and it doesn't use chemical pesticides and fertilizers in order to produce nutritious food and reduce health risks. However, there is still a lack of knowledge on this very topic in the EU, but to be honest, it's a fairly new uh, way of sustainable agriculture. It was uh, created in the 70s. Now, our project's aim is kind of a modest one. Mr. Gluck, I really liked your, your comment on the role of politics, that the good politics should provide incentives um, to kind of... Um, to kind of help uh, the private sphere. And our aim is very similar. We would like to create a separate permaculture fund that could serve as the basis for educating people, researching newer, newer and more sustainable agricultural and permacultural techni techniques and subsidizing produ uh, permacultural products and starting new communities. <clears throat> Hence creating uh, the, the good incentives for our better agriculture in the EU. Now, just to reiterate, the problem is unsustainable monocropping. It's the, um, it's the practice of uh, producing the same time of crop year after year on the same land, and that results in the loss of biodiversity, low nutrition density foods, and it poses serious health risks uh, given the excessive use of pesticides. Um, and uh, permaculture would be the solution for these problems. We desperately need a separate permaculture fund in the EU because only 7% of EU farmland is used for organic production and even a smaller percentage of that is used especially for permaculture. And the current EU financial, our agricultural financial support system is not adequate um, because it does not really distinguish between organic and non-organic farming when allocating resources. Uh, and in general, there is a lack of knowledge about permaculture in the EU, which we aim to change by actually educating the population. And thank you very much. This is our project. And yeah, just a couple of references. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, David, for presenting us your proposal. Mr. Gluck, I would like uh, you to share your thoughts on this proposal with a short feedback, please. Yeah, I'd love to. So first of all, David, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I always um, I always enjoy to work together with people from Hungary. So for example, I have two really, really cool colleagues here. It's Anna Donat and it's Kathleen J. Um, I, I, th those are really one of my favorite colleagues I have here because we really work together very, very well. And so I'm really happy to deal with the Hungarian here. Um, so first of all, when it um, comes to, to, to um, permaculture, um, the term is new, but what's in there actually is not. If you really take the chance and talk to old farmers, and I'm not talking about farmers like with huge farms, like being industrial already, but if you really talk to old farmers, um, I live in a very rural regions. And so I, I know a lot of farmers and also a lot of traditional farmers like having farms like with about between 60 and 80 hectares, if it's big, a lot of them are even smaller. And crop rotation, for example, um, is nothing new and that you, destroy your soil if you just go for um, monocropping. It's really, really very, very clear for them. And so in this way, I believe it is their own soil. 
It is their own field they're working with. And they want to keep their soil and their fields good for the next generation as well, because probably their children will also be farmers and will work there. So um, what I, what I want to say is that, that permaculture, maybe the term is new, but what's, what you mean with permaculture, the thoughts are not really new. Um, I believe in a lot of things. Um, I, I believe in a lot of things we need education. So take Germany as an example. Maybe maybe Jessica can 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 say something to this later on as well as a moderator. But um, there is no country in the European Union where so much money is being spent for technical kitchen equipment than in Germany. But there is not one single country giving so few of money for for the food. So it means in our highly equipped, very expensive kitchen, we cook junk. Basically, I mean, not all of us, and I believe that a lot of, a lot of people the last years kind of realized that it's not that cheap meat, for example, it's not really a good thing. And so this is the reason why I believe, and maybe this can be the second question, when it comes to labeling. So I personally think we should have an ethical label on, 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 on meat, for example. This is like really important for me. And I think society is changing a little bit. At least this is what I, what I see like like for the for the last years um and i do a lot of a lot of cooking by the way so i'm really a foodie and um and this is really what i experienced um what i experienced already for a couple of years what what i believe is need education um i believe that when it comes to nutrition for example we should already talk about this a lot more at school so how comes we can, we can, you know, we learn so much stuff at school and I really believe it is, it is so important, you know, mathematics, literature, all, all the sciences, for example, no, 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 no doubt about that, you know, but, but on the other hand, we also have to make sure that our children, you probably don't have children yet, but I do, um, that, that our children um, really like get in mind that nutrition is like the most important thing. And then, then people will also say, okay, if the food we are buying is a little bit more expensive. Um, then there is the next discussion. Then there is like, you know, somebody could say, oh, you're a politician, you're a medical doctor. For you, it doesn't matter if food is like more, uh, more expensive or whatever. This is not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about that it has not have to be meat every day, for example. I'm talking about... Um, that if there is meat, there is not only a fillet steak or, or, um, um, or a, how do you call it, uh, Rostbraten, um, roast. yeah, roast, yeah, fillet or roast beef, for example. There is not only fillets and roast beef, there's, for example, a lot of parts in an animal. Um, we have to make sure if we kill it for food, that we will use it, please. And I mean, I'm talking about all the parts, you know, from an ethical point of view and those meat parts for example you can get like for very few money even if you go to your best best butcher so all i want to say to this is we have to go for a lot of more um education so um and i think society already changed and then i believe farmers will also have enough money to do what they actually want to do that they don't go for monocropping but um crop rotation or crop sequence Thank you, Mr. Glück, for your feedback on this proposal. Um, speaking about the values in the food system, um, some of us are maybe familiar with the concept uh, of the farm to fork strategy of the EU. So how does, uh, does, it come, does it come with an allocation from funds uh, from industrial to small scale sustainable agriculture? So, um, pardon. Please, please say the question again. I'm sorry, I wasn't concentrated. Yeah, of course. Um, about the farm to fork strategy of the EU, um, does it come with an allocation of funds from industrial to small scale um, sustainable agriculture? Um, I'm not. But I'm actually, hang on. Just yeah, just hang on. Um, so. Um, the farm to fork strategy is one of the elements of the Green Deal of the Commission. And um, actually, we really wanted to work on this, the farm to fork strategy. 
but um, now kind of COVID came in between. So we don't really know what, what, what will be included in the farm to fork strategy yet. I believe that like um, an allocation of money could be one thing, but not every single problem is going to be solved if you just like, you know, pour out money and all this. Um, I really believe we have to go for more education when it, when it comes to nutrition and to farming. And I still don't see the bad farmer who wants to, you know, like be really bad, wants to destroy his own soil, wants to treat his animals like really bad. I believe that farmers are very often good persons which have to take place in a market and we have to give them the chance to do the right thing. And so um, they need more money. If this is really state money, which has to be allocated, or if it is maybe money that we have to, that, that, that people are just, you know, able and willing to pay a little bit more for their food. Um, um, I suppose this question is open. Let's, let's face it how the farm to fork strategy will be. Um, like I said, I suppose this will be one of the first subjects we will go to um, after the COVID crisis. Thank you for your comment. Um, if you agree, I would like to move now to the second proposal, just to make sure that everyone has the same amount of time. And later we can go back to the first proposal and sure. answer questions. Um, today with us, we have Valfon that will, be, will tell us something more about his team's proposal uh, that's called Food for Future. Alfon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica, for introducing me. And Thank you, Mr. Gluck, for, for sharing your time with us. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so I can bring up the infographic for our project. If you bear with me just one second. There you go. So as, as Jessica said, the name of our proposal is Food for Future. And we worked on, on this proposal last year in, in an exchange organized by, organized by Youth for Europe in Spain. Uh, our team members are Daniel from the UK, Vivian from Hungary, myself and Alba from Spain, and Beatrice from Italy. So quite, quite an international team like all the others. So yeah, um, our proposal tackles the issue of food waste in, in the EU. And we, we know that it's, a, it's, a, it's something that people think about sometimes, food waste, but we're not so sure that people realize really the magnitude and and the consequences of the problem. So in, in terms of the magnitude of how big a problem it is, we have here some figures uh, like 88 million tons of food go to waste every year in the European Union alone. So this, if we do the math you know, on a per person basis, is basically each one of us throwing out half a kilogram of food every day, which is huge. A lot. To, to, mm. to put it uh, simply. Um, we also looked at where the food waste is happening along the chain, and we realized that more than half of the food that ends up being wasted happens at the household after the food arrives to the home. And then we saw that another 17% is lost at the distribution point at supermarkets and restaurants. So we put together these two, and they combine to 70% of all food waste. And this is where we, where we focused our, our, our policy proposal. But before we go into our actual policy proposal, why is um, food waste a bad problem? It's a big problem, but it's also a bad problem. And uh, food waste has very serious consequences for the environment, uh, like loss of biodiversity, depletion of natural resources like water, land, or energy, and obviously the wastage of fertile land that could be put to other uses. We, we think it also helps to look at the problem from an economic perspective. Uh, if we put food waste annually in the EU in uh, euros, it's equivalent to more than 140 billion euros, which is give or take the annual GDP of Hungary. So it's like quite significant again. But for us, on top of the magnitude of food waste in Europe and the consequences of it, we believe there is a moral imperative as simple as the fact that if there is people going hungry, if there is people that don't have access to quality meals or food, we shouldn't. We just simply shouldn't be wasting food. So 
we have an ambitious, bold vision for a food waste free European Union by 2025. And we want to get there under the values of efficiency and equity. So to realize this vision, we propose a three point action plan. First, to raise awareness through campaigns and education at school. So citizens realize how bad the problem of food waste is and how big it is. Secondly, to provide EU funding at the municipality level so public compost facilities can be set up and citizens can dispose of the food that they're not gonna eat in an appropriate way. And third, to create an EU certification or label that can be awarded to supermarkets or restaurants if they commit to being zero food waste. So you as a consumer know where, where to spend your money responsibly. So this is our plan to achieve zero food waste in the European Union by 2025. Let's taste our food, not waste it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfon, for sharing your proposal with us. Mr. Glick, I would like to ask you once more to give your thoughts about this proposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. And by the way, because, because I was talking about my Hungarian colleagues before, actually my neighbor here in, uh, in Brussels, he's really living like, like right next door, um, is Luis Garricano, also one of the very, very good colleagues um, of, of myself here in the European Parliament. So first of all, um, I believe that food waste is like really, really important. We have to keep an eye on this. I, I believe that from an economical point of view, it doesn't make sense. You just mentioned the number, it's like 140 billion of euros, which is like throw in the garbage, which is like really, really bad. Um, but also from an ethical point of view, um, I think there, should, <laughs> there would be no world hunger if we could manage the distribution, for example. Um, so also from an ethical point of view, um, I don't want to live with the thought that in my Europe, in our Europe, um, people are just wasting food where at the other end of the world, and maybe it's uh, maybe the end of the world is not so, so far away. If we talk about our direct neighbor, it's the continent of Africa. And so we already face a lot of hunger there. So, so I think from an ethical point of view, this is not very good. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I didn't go for a request in food waste for the commission, but I have been here for about eight weeks. And because I told you, I, I work a lot with food because I, I love to cook. I have a lot of friends of mine, of mine which are professional chefs. Um, I'm even about to, to write a book about cooking, but, but that's another thing. Um, and, and, and actually, this is what's supposed to be in the book. I want to encourage people, you know, like if this one animal is being killed, just use all of it. And because of that, I have to go for the recipes that people really can take, like the whole thing. But, but what, I, what I actually want to say is that I, I, was, um, I, I went for a request on meat waste. And I asked the commission how much meat is being wasted in the European Union annually. And you know what the really, really bad thing about the answer was? They told me they don't know. They told me they don't know. Um, they, they have numbers of um, food production in Europe, but those numbers are kind of like hard to tell how much is it really. But because we have so many imports on meat as well, we don't really know how much meat do we have and we don't know how much people really eat and how much people will throw away. And I think, this is really, really bad that we don't even have any data about, about meat, weight, meat waste in, in this case. So this was one of the really first um, topics I, I um, con concentrated on. And so um, for your three points, I can just like congratulate to point number one. I think we need, we need campaigning and we need education, especially um, already beginning at school and I'm already talking about about children in elementary school I'm not talking out, uh, only about 15 or 16 year old um, young young people I'm, I'm really talking about children um, so this is really really important campaigning and um, school education so 
public, I, to be honest, I didn't really understand the point with public composting facilities. We do have a lot of um, public composting facilities. We have a lot of um, uh, biogas. We run with uh, food wasted. So at least in Germany, I know that that all the wasted food coming coming from companies or restaurants, they're not supposed to to put it in the garbage, but they will. I mean, it's really bad if they have to throw away stuff. Sure, sure about that. But if they have to throw it away, I really believe it makes sense that um, that we put them into uh, biogas and that at least there is some electricity coming out um, at, at the other end. Um, and then what you said before was, was labeling. I believe um, labeling is a really, really good Think it, it can be a really good thing. Let me put it that way. Um, I, for myself, I, I, I really hope that there is a that there would be a, like a really good ethical label for meat, for example. You know, this for me personally, this would be really, really good. But I believe we should we should go for labeling, but it shouldn't be mandatory. Um, why do I don't believe it is mandatory? Because if you go things and make it mandatory, you have to whatever label, otherwise you're not supposed to sell your food anymore. I don't really believe in that, but just give it, give it to people as an offer. Let's go for good education. Let's tell people, you know, why it is so important to have good food and why, why we have to handle um, food waste. And so, for example, in the, if this is included in a label, I'm really, really sure that the percentage of people looking for this label and buying things with this label will increase. So I'm a huge friend of labeling food as long as it is not mandatory. Because very often, if you want to reach something in politics and you do it the wrong way, you get the opposite of what you really want to get. So I believe not in mandatory, but in labeling itself would be a very, very good thing um, combined with the most important thing for a liberal, which is education. Thank you, Mr. Guk. I have one more question uh, uh, for you about this proposal. Um, how do you think the uptake about their proposed certification would be amongst food retailers? Um, and how do you think they could be motivated or incentivized? I believe we, like, like I said, I believe we have to go for, it, for, it, for education because if we have customers which really look for such a label, um, I believe that um, also the retailers um, will put more of this food in their program. Um, and as you know, in Germany, for example, the, um, the food coming from Ökologische Landbau, for example, the bio food, which or organic food in English, but in German it's, it's um, bio ware. Um, the demand is huge. The, and the demand was actually growing for the last couple of years. But um, at the same time, when you find something in Germany and it says bio, which means organic food, who is the, the largest producer of organic food worldwide? You know? It's China. A lot of the organic food is coming from China. I'm sorry, guys. This is not what I really believe is... <laughs> I mean, it's good that people in China have organic food in China as well, but I don't... I, don't, I, I, I just see the problem that if we... If we have a label, for example, uh, and you really think, okay, it's organic and you buy it and afterwards you find out it was produced in China and a lot of organic food being sold in the European Union is from China, then I just think it's not the right label, you know? Um, and so, so um, I believe we have to go for this, for this education thing. This is like the most important thing. And then I'm really, really sure that also retailers will, will go for, for organic food for more organic food and we need critical customers which really kind of keep an eye um, where the organic food is coming from and if you have good labels it's just better. Thank you Mr. Gluck for answering, answering the questions. Um, if I could steer just a little bit more of time I would like to read now a one or one or two questions from our audience. Um, we have one question about the permaculture um, do you have a suggestion to motivate farmers for being more eco-friendly when we talk about local farming? So first of all, um, I, I kind of don't really like the question, to be honest. Um, 
to kind of, I, I, I don't believe that for 99% per, 99 of the farmers, we don't have to teach them to be eco-friendly. I think, I think um, a lot of them are because it's their soil, it's their animals, it's their soil, it's their fields, uh, it's their grassland. So they, they don't really want to destroy it. Um, but at the same time, um, they take part in a market and market prices for products are so low that farmers are sometimes struggling really, really bad. So I would say, if you give the farmers the opportunity that they raise more money with the food they're selling, um, then they, they are eco-friendly, you know? Like, I don't, and this is the reason why I said I don't really kind of like this question, because, because politics very often is very, very skeptical against farmers. But if you really take a closer look at farmers, they don't have any interest to destroy their own ground and their own soil. Thank you so much for answering our questions today, Mr. Glück. I guess we reached now the time limit. And so I want you, um, Mr. Glück, to share one last thought or advice with us you might have for our audience or in general, something you want to say before we leave. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I never wanted to hear there is a problem and we can't do anything about it. This is not, this is, and this is the reason I never wanted to become a, become a politician. I was really happy with my life as a medical, as a medical doctor. So I actually never wanted to go into politics, but very, very often I just heard the words, you know, you can, you can change anything about it. You know, a lot of people that just decided for um, criticizing things without going and taking the chance for changing things. And it really makes me very, very happy that I have a, a group of young people sitting virtually in front of me um, who really share this attempt that I chose myself. Um, if there are things you don't like, just go and change it. You can and don't start complaining, just do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Glück, for joining us today and for listening to our participants' proposals. And also a big thank you to Alphon and David for presenting us your team's amazing work. Thanks everyone who followed us on Facebook and sent us nice, interesting questions. And yeah, of thank course, you. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much. And, and, and what, I, what I've got is actually um, the written thing is here, but maybe, maybe David and Alfonso can send me their presentations as well because they were really good. Okay. I guess I guess I will manage. Um, and of course, uh, in, um, in the end, a big thank you for the ones that made this happen to our big you for Europe team. And I hope to see you all in Brussels to stay updated. You can follow us on our Facebook page and please don't miss our next conference where we'll be talking about clean energy and environment.